Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher of history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fifth, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, and welcome in to A Teacher of History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me again today. Did you know that the massacre at Goliad was far more of a motivator to many Texian troops than that of the Alamo? That the Battle of San Jacinto is one of the most lopsided battles in military history? And that the Texians were able to cruise to an easy victory at the Battle of San Jacinto because many of the Mexican soldiers were napping? Did you know all of this? Maybe. Maybe not. Get your notebooks out, because today we will cover that and more in episode 134, Goliad and San Jacinto. All right, everyone, welcome into the podcast. Uh, Book recommendation. I just picked it up recently. I wish I had prior to doing all these uh, episodes on the Texas Revolution, but it is good and very detailed, yet uh, pretty digestible. So I'd recommend you check it out. It's called The Texian Iliad, A Military History of the Texas Revolution by Stephen Hardin. It's up on the website under book recommendations. Um, <clears throat> so I have a new producer. Uh, one of the reasons why the last couple episodes have not really been dropped in our normal release pattern that and me making a couple mistakes with the recording and leaving my microphone at my parents' house and all kinds of other stupid things that I did. So we are back uh, with episode 134. I apologize for all the delays recently. A couple things. I don't know if I said something that was like really insulting to people or what, but I've gotten a couple really, really tough reviews recently to go along with some other great ones, right, which is awesome. So if you uh, do enjoy the show and you are learning something along with us, you're willing to go onto iTunes and leave a five-star rating and a review, that would really mean a ton um, to help balance out some of the uh, some of the pretty tough reviews we've gotten recently. They're really mean, too. I don't, I don't know what, what I did or said, but uh, it is, you know, it is election season, so people do get uh, pretty worked up about some things, uh, even if we don't talk about politics on this podcast. Uh, people, I think, have a tendency to extrapolate some things. Uh, lastly, in episode 133, Bill mentioned, I, I believe it was Bill who mentioned that Texas was the only independent nation that then became a state. Zach corrected him and said California too. Uh, it was pointed out on Twitter to us right after we dropped that episode, duh, Hawaii is another one, and Vermont technically falls into that also. So there were four of them, not just one. And, uh, you know, this is a great opportunity for me to remind you that as we go through this podcast, and especially in the extra credit episodes when Bill, Zach, and I are just sort of riffing back and forth about uh, history, there may be some things we say that aren't factually accurate, that were a mistake or uh, could be misinterpreted um, or misconstrued. So please let us know if that happens. And, of course, let me know on the solo podcast, too. If uh, I say something that isn't fully accurate or maybe I uh, put it in the wrong context, whatever it is, let me know because I want to point that out uh, on the next podcast because the whole point of this is to make a uh, history of the United States that is digestible and entertaining but also accurate. So last episode, Bill uh, and Zach, as I mentioned, were on the pod to give their perspective on the Battle of the Alamo and its impact and legacy in American history. As you probably picked up from listening to 133, there really wasn't a lot of fighting worth talking about at the siege and subsequent battle of the Alamo. In fact, the fighting only lasted 90 minutes, and the siege, well, 
that was like two weeks long. I don't think anyone wants to hear a blow-by-blow account of a siege, and if you do, well, sorry about that. This isn't the podcast for you. Anyway, as we discussed last week, the importance of the Alamo, both at the time and in our national memory, is much more about what it represented and how it was communicated at the time. And of course, Hollywood and Walt Disney, like seemingly everything else well-known in our history, played a pretty big role too. That being said, it is still a consequential moment in Texas and American history, no matter what Bill says. But what we will see as we move on from the Alamo to subsequent events in this revolution is that the Tornell Decree that eliminated any possibility of taking prisoners of war really backfired on the Mexican army. In the end, when we talk about war and conflict, while it is brutal and vicious, there were still and still are certain expectations of how people should behave and what is allowable by the unwritten rules of war and what isn't. And executing soldiers that surrender and even at times their family members? Well, it doesn't matter what type of law or decree you pass prior to the fighting. That's just not okay and most likely never will be. So, what exactly happened after the Battle of the Alamo? If you remember, the Battle of the Alamo took place on March 6th, 1836, and of course, from there, the legend of the Alamo began. Now, like we mentioned last week, the battle itself, just on paper, wasn't much to write home about. Santa Ana had described it as a, quote, small affair. But while it may not seem big in the grand scheme of things, there are some legitimate reasons that it has become notable. The best estimates have the Mexican total casualties around 500, which is pretty impressive, considering that was about double the amount of Texians killed. Coupling the great casualty rate, at least from a Texian perspective, of Mexican soldiers with stories of heroism, grit, and principle, you can see why the Alamo sort of took on a life of its own. But I don't think it would have been as big of a deal if it weren't for Santa Ana's draconian way of dealing with the survivors. A popular story of Davy Crockett had him surrendering to the Mexican troops before being executed, while another one had him dying in battle with, quote, no less than 16 Mexican corpses surrounding his body. Following the battle and the execution of all the surviving Texian soldiers, the Mexican army burned the corpses. As Zach mentioned last episode, Travis's slave Joe was spared with instructions to tell the news of the overwhelming Mexican victory to anyone who would hear him. Santa Ana then gave similar instructions to the surviving women and children, whom he allowed to return to their homes, encouraging them to let everyone know just how unstoppable the Mexican army was under his leadership. Now, during the siege of the Alamo, what was going on back at the convention that they were holding? Well, Four days before the Battle of the Alamo, on March 2nd, 1836, the Texas delegate formally declared independence from Mexico. Yay! During this convention, though, the delegates received word from Travis that things were not looking so good for them at the Alamo. Resisting the urge to cut everything short and try to save their comrades in San Antonio, the delegate stayed to write a formal constitution, while Sam Houston, who was now in sole control of the Texas forces, decided to travel to Gonzales to rendezvous with the men already there. But things did not go well for Houston in Gonzales, and really things aren't going to go so well for Houston over the next month and a half. Shortly after arriving in Gonzales, word had come that the men at the Alamo had been killed by the Mexican army, and that army was coming right for them. It was at this point that Sam Houston had to face a sobering reality. He could either retreat or stand to defend his fixed position in Gonzalez. Knowing that his fellow soldiers just tried that and lost spectacularly, and knowing that the Texas government was wholly unable to provide his untrained volunteers with the supplies he would need, Houston decided to call for a retreat of his forces. The soldiers and civilians all fled Gonzalez as quickly as they possibly could, burning the town to the ground in the process. Santa Ana had the Texians where he wanted them. He sent 700 troops after Houston and another 600 as reinforcements. From Santa Ana's perspective, it was just a matter of time until the Texians gave it up. He outnumbered them 6-1, to and once word got out just how overpowering his forces were, the resistance would just disappear. 
but that's not at all what happened. In fact, Santa Ana's treatment of the men at the Alamo and his intimidating numbers actually prompted men to flock to support their fellow Texian soldiers in Houston's army. The New York Post wrote that, in fact, quote, had Santa Ana treated the vanquished with moderation and generosity, it would have been difficult, if not impossible, to awaken the general sympathy for the people of Texas, which now impels so many adventurous and ardent spirits to throng to the aid of their brethren. While many of Santa Ana's men were laying siege to the Alamo, a large contingent of his troops traveled to the Gulf Coast to try to reclaim the land the Texians had gained control of at the outset of the revolution. For about two weeks, the Mexican forces traveled town by town, overwhelming the Texian rebels, eventually heading north toward Goliad. If you recall, James Fannin and about 500 Texian forces had been occupying Goliad due to its fort and its location along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. Fannin believed that if Goliad remained in Texian occupation, they would be able to continue to prevent the Mexican troops from gaining supplies from the Gulf of Mexico. Now, if you recall from episode 133, Fannin had been called to lend support to General Travis during the siege of the Alamo, but he was unable to get his men and supplies there in time, eventually turning around at the San Antonio River to head back to Goliad. And he knew he needed to get back because General Urias' forces were driving up the coast toward Goliad. But facing overwhelming odds, it became clear that defending Goliad was going to be a fool's errand, similar to the Alamo. With that in mind, Sam Houston, on March 11th, just five days after the defeat at the Alamo, ordered Fannin and his men to retreat from Goliad. But Fannin was stuck. He had sent his horses and carts to a nearby town, Refugio, with one of his officers, and he didn't have the ability to retreat, or so he believed. So while Fannin dithered trying to decide what to do next and when to do it, Urea sent a force of 1,500 men to spread out around Goliad and surround it, preventing a Texian escape. Eventually, on March 19th, eight days later, Fannin and his men did begin their retreat, and they walked right into Urea's trap. The Mexican forces met them on an open prairie, and while the Texians fought valiantly and saw many more Mexicans fall during the fighting than Texians, the numbers' advantage was just too much. That evening, as fighting paused with the sunset, Fannin refused to leave his wounded men, and when he found out the Mexicans were getting reinforced with even more men to continue fighting the next morning, he knew that it was time to throw in the towel. Now you may be thinking, what are they doing? Don't they know this is a death sentence? Well, no, they didn't. Fannin had no idea that the Mexican forces were not giving quarter to surrendered soldiers. He was under the impression and had been misled to believe that they would. So Fannin and his men were marched back to Goliad and held prisoner at Fort Defiance. General Urea, believing himself to be an honorable man, was sick to his stomach with the reality that he was under orders, technically, to execute the hundreds of Texian soldiers who had peacefully surrendered. Hoping to wash his hands of the inevitable bloodbath, Urea handed over command to Colonel Portilla and then proceeded to ask Santa Anna to please show clemency toward Fannin and his men. But Santa Anna had no patience for these rebels, and he was determined that this was going to be the first and last rebellion in Texas, and he was going to deal with it the way he wanted to deal with it. No way was he going to allow these men to walk free just to join back up with Houston and take up arms against him again. In order to make sure there was no confusion, Santa Ana sent three copies of his execution orders to Portilla. When Portilla received them, he knew he had no choice. Early in the morning on March 27th, Colonel Portilla had the 342 Texian POWs march out of Fort Defiance. The Mexican soldiers, surely struggling with the moral dilemma that faced them, lined up at close range to the Texian soldiers in open fire, attempting to execute all 342 of them. Those that didn't die on the first volley were beaten and stabbed to death, most of them at least. Many that tried to flee were run down by the Mexican cavalry and murdered. 
the wounded Texians who were resting in Fort Defiance were simultaneously bayoneted where they lay. One of the survivors who escaped, H. von Ehrenberg, wrote about his experience. Quote, Kneel down, now burst in harsh accents from the lips of the Mexican commander. No one stirred. Few of us understood the order, and those that did would not obey. The Mexican soldiers, who stood just about three paces from us, leveled their muskets at our breast. Even then, we could hardly believe that they meant to shoot us, for if we had, we should assuredly have rushed forward in our desperation, and weaponless though we were, some of our murderers would have met their death at our hands. The sound of a second volley, from a different direction than that of the first, just then reached our ears, and was followed by a confused cry, as if those at whom it had been aimed had not all immediately been killed. A thick cloud of smoke was wreathing toward the San Antonio River. The blood of my lieutenant was all my clothes, and around me lay my friends convulsed in their last agony. I saw nothing more. Unhurt myself, I sprang up and concealed by the thick smoke fled along the hedge in the direction of the river. The noise of the water for my guide. On I went, the river rolled at my feet, the shouting and yelling behind, Texas forever! And without a moment's hesitation, I plunged into the water. The bullets whistled around me as I swam slowly and wearily to the other side, but none wounded me. Whilst these horrible scenes were occurring on the prairies, Colonel Fannin and his wounded companions were shot and bayoneted at Goliad. Only Dr. Shackelford and a few hospital aides having their lives spared in order that they might attend to the wounded Mexicans. There was only one Texian who was intentionally spared, other than the doctors, at least initially. That was James Fannin. Fannin was marched to a courtyard and placed in a seat due to the wound in his leg. He made a few requests, including being shot in the heart, not in the face, and being given a Christian burial. Just to be cruel, Fannin was then shot in the face, and then his body was burned in a heap of his fellow soldiers' corpses. Some of the men were able to escape through various means, including faking their own death, following the Mexican opening fire and escaping, just like von Ehrenberg did. In the end, the massacre at the Goliad went down in Texas and American history, and this just blatant murderous event was quite the inspiration for Houston and his men to continue fighting against the Mexican army. While the Mexican forces were executing Fannin and his men at Goliad, Houston's army had gotten word that another contingent of the Mexican army, about 1,400 total troops, were heading his way, far outnumbering the 400 or so that he had under his command. Houston immediately ordered a northward retreat of soldiers and citizens. As the Texians were retreating, it was beginning to sink into Houston and his men that they were the last chance for Texas independence. They were it, and it wasn't looking good. But news of the Alamo began to spread, and then later, news of the Goliath Massacre. Men from all over Texas and adjacent states began to rush to Houston, volunteering to sign up to fight back against the Mexican army that had shown themselves to be both brutal and cruel. Houston's army was growing, and at one point it was up to about 1,400 men. The challenge he had was that they were untrained, ill-equipped, and impatient. Houston knew that these men were probably only good for, like, one fight. They didn't have the dedication or commitment to hang around for a series of engagements. Knowing this, he tried everything he could to avoid battle, frustrating some of the more trigger-happy members of his army. After a few weeks of retreat, the murmurs of Houston's cowardice were murmurs no longer. People were openly questioning what Houston was doing and whether he had a plan after all. Interim Secretary of War Thomas Risk told Houston that if he didn't fight, he would be replaced. Things were getting so bad that the interim president of Texas, David Burnett, wrote to Houston that, quote, The enemy are laughing at you to scorn. You must fight them. You must retreat no further. The country expects you to fight. The salvation of the country depends on your doing so. But even in the face of all this pressure, Sam Houston had a plan and he was sticking to it no matter who had a problem with it. 
He posted warnings around camp that if anyone openly tried to threaten his power or take action to replace him in some way, he would have them executed, and he wasn't afraid to make good on that promise. He knew he had one shot at the Mexican army, and he was going to wait for the right opportunity. Meanwhile, Santa Ana received word that back in Mexico City, the interim president who had been filling in for him, Miguel Barragan, had passed away. It seems sensible that Santa Ana would head to Mexico City, hand over command of the army to General Urea, and just allow him to finish up with Houston and his troops, and then head back to Mexico victorious. But Santa Ana was a paranoid dude. He knew that Urea was becoming more and more popular with each victory, and he was afraid of the idea of him, Santa Ana, being holed up in Mexico City with the incredibly popular Urea potentially marching south in victory with an army in tow. And if you know anything about Roman history, you can extrapolate what may happen if Urea were to cross the uh, Mexican version of the Rubicon. So, Santa Ana was determined to personally see this victory through to the end. Santa Ana, frustrated that he was unable to keep chasing Houston across the Brazos River due to the Texians who had barricaded the river crossing, decided to try to do the next best thing, capture the Texas government. Oh man, did he come close, too. While Santa Ana and his 700 soldiers were just miles away, the Texas delegates were able to escape capture. Livid that they were getting away, Santa Ana sent his cavalry to chase them down, and the cavalry finally caught up to Burnett and the other delegates of the Texas government right as they were pushing their boats off land and heading toward Galveston Island. While Santa Ana was frustrated that he was thwarted at the Brazos River and allowed the government officials to escape, he knew this rebellion was only hanging on by a thread, and it was just a matter of time. Santa Ana, with plans to eventually join forces with the other contingents of his army, began to march east, after being given poor intelligence that Houston and his men were going to try to join the Texas government on Galveston Island. And unfortunately for Santa Ana, Houston's Texian forces captured a Mexican courier who was carrying intelligence containing all the Mexican troop movements, locations, and the size of their forces. Houston knew that Santa Ana only had about 700 men and figured this was going to be his best chance to attack. With about 900 men of his own remaining in his army, these were the best odds he was ever going to get. Houston gathered his soldiers, and in an impassioned speech, he called on them to, quote, remember the Alamo and remember the Goliad, extolling them of the virtues of the Texian forces and the opportunity to avenge the murders of their fellow men. Whipped up into a frenzy, Houston, his Texian soldiers, and his Tejano soldiers began their march to meet Santa Ana head-on to decide the fate of Texas once and for all, five weeks after their retreat had initially begun. And this would be the determining battle in the, Mex in the Texas Revolution, the Battle of San Jacinto. Knowing where Santa Ana's troops were headed, Houston and his men beat him to the spot along the San Jacinto River in what, is known, what was known as Lynch's Ferry. The Texas army made camp in a wooded area along the bank of the bayou. Houston, arriving first, was able to pick his camp location, but it still wasn't without risk. The wooded area and the banks of the bayou helped conceal their full forces and give them some cover, which will really come in handy. But with the bayou to their rear, the river to their northern flank, and the woods to their southern flank, Houston's men had no opportunity for retreat. Knowing this, and having seen the result of surrendering forces at the Alamo and Goliad, this battle was going to be all or nothing for the Texas army. Without much else to choose from and refusing to run from a fight, Santa Ana, against the advice and counsel of his fellow officers, chose a spot to camp in an open prairie about 500 yards from the Texas forces, with the river and woods on his flanks too. In fact, this location was so bad that one of the Mexican colonels quipped that, quote, the camping ground of His Excellency's selection was in all respects against military rules. Any youngster would have done better. With both armies making camp on April 20th, a couple skirmishes broke out between the forces with some over-eager Texians leaving camp against Houston's orders to join in on the action. 
giving Santa Ana a better idea of the full strength of the Texas Army and infuriating Houston in the process. Being a vulnerable location, Santa Ana had his men work throughout the night of April 20th, building breastworks and defenses for the battle that was bound to occur on the 21st. By early morning, Santa Ana's reinforcements had arrived when General Kos presented him with over 500 more men, bringing his total somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 men. Knowing that Kos was on his way, and underestimating the strength of Houston's men were likely the reasons why Santa Ana was willing to set up camp in such a vulnerable location. In the end, from his perspective, every major engagement of the last couple months had been overwhelmingly won by the Mexican forces, and this one should be no different. Or so he thought. But Santa Ana was a bit confused. He naturally had assumed that the Texan forces would meet him in battle on the 21st. His men were exhausted from preparing defenses throughout the night, and Kos's men were exhausted and hungry. They had marched all night, and they hadn't eaten anything. If Houston wasn't going to attack, it made little sense for Santa Ana to have his forces at the ready. By afternoon, it was clear to Santa Ana, or so he thought, that the Texan attack wasn't coming anytime soon, and maybe not at all that day. So in order to make the best use of the time he had available to him, Santa Ana gave Colse's men permission to rest or take a nap. A fiesta, as they would call it in Mexico. It was right in the middle of the afternoon, 2 or 3 o'clock, and there had been no movement from Houston and his men. And from Santa Ana's perspective, if Houston hadn't begun the battle by now, he was clearly planning on waiting until tomorrow. Right? Wrong. What Santa Ana didn't realize is that Houston absolutely was planning on attacking that day and had already begun to put his plan into action. Houston had the bridge out of Brazos destroyed to prevent any effective Mexican retreat and lined his men up to prepare for battle in the afternoon. Staying well hidden in the tall grass in the cover of the banks of the bayou, the Texan army readied themselves for a full frontal assault getting as close as 200 yards away without Santa Ana and his men even realizing it. At 4.30 p.m. on April 21st, 1836, the Texian army fired the Twin Sisters, two cannons they had arrived from Cincinnati earlier that month, and then immediately charged at the unsuspecting Mexican army. Screaming, Remember the Alamo! And Remember La Bahia! Which was the fort at Goliad. And Remember the Goliad! the Texian forces rushed toward the Mexican breastwork, immediately overwhelming their initial defenses. Santa Ana, his officers, and his men were all stunned. Some of them were literally sleeping, while others were resting with their guard down, not physically, mentally, or emotionally ready for a fight. With their men frantic, Santa Ana and the other Mexican officers tried to organize them into a defensive position, but it was too little, too late. In less than 20 minutes, the Texian forces had overrun the Mexican breastwork and forced the soldiers to flee. In retribution for the massacres of the Alamo and the Goliad, the Texian soldiers chased down the fleeing Mexican forces for hours to put them out of their misery. Houston and his officers tried to stop the killings, but they were unable to. Recognizing that it was due to retribution for the Alamo, some Mexican soldiers begged with the Texian forces, explaining as best they could in broken English that they were not present for those massacres and not responsible. But their cries for mercy and clemency fell on deaf ears. In one of the more lopsided battles in military history, the Texian forces overwhelmed Santa Ana and his men, and the battle was over really before it even began. The Texans lost only 11 men and another few dozen injured. That's it. Conversely, the Mexicans lost 650 soldiers and surrendered another 300. Absolutely shocking numbers. But while the Battle of San Jacinto was a rousing success, Houston knew that this war was far from over. The Mexican army still had over 4,000 men in Texas under the command of General Urea and General Fiosola. He needed to figure out a way to leverage this victory to end the war because there is no way he would be able to repeat this type of success under different circumstances. And that is where we will leave off in this episode.
Santa Anna and his men were ambushed, taken by surprise, and captured. Houston and the Texans have the leverage with the capture of Santa Anna, but still face the overwhelming odds against them. They're going to keep on fighting. Next week, we'll talk about how Houston used this leverage to end the war and what the aftermath of this victory meant for Texas and for the United States of America. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. A Teacher of History of the United States is supported by its fans at patreon.com slash teachershistory. Those of you who are able to contribute, I can't thank you enough as it keeps the podcast going and allows me to continue to make time to try to provide you with the most in-depth and comprehensive history of our nation that I possibly can. Sincere thank you to all of our patrons at the Teacher's Pet and History Nerd level who help sponsor the show. Their names can be found on our website at aTeacher'sHistory.com. And a super special thanks to our patrons at the History Nerd level. Krista Samstadt, Rita Huckle, Tammy Smith, and Pamela Caldwell. Thanks, Mom. And my new best friend, Norma McLaughlin. We couldn't do the show without you.